Welcome back to the Barbican in the City of London. We're standing on ground once occupied in Roman times and changed in many ways since. The modern Barbican estate was built to meet chronic housing needs after this area suffered badly in the Blitz. COVID-19 may not be a war, but it has been a seismic moment in our lives. The streets around here lie mainly quiet, with most workers no longer commuting to desks in offices that lie empty. Since lockdown eased, the number of people seeking a different way of life has grown exponentially, with a 126% increase of people looking to leave the cities and move to villages, according to one property site. But is it just a pipe dream that will fade away as we go back to our old routines? Or will this be a moment of real revolution, changing the way we live and work and changing the shape of our cities and towns forever? In a moment, we'll be discussing all of this. But first, Matt Fry reports now on how the massive shifts wrought by COVID-19 are forcing us to think again about what we want from where we live. This pandemic is, it's, uh, has produced an acceleration in awareness on our fragility. We have to redefine our role in the planet. The coincidence of climate change and now COVID has forced us to rethink so much, and that includes how and where we want to live. It's time to reimagine the cities of the future with their impact on our own health and on the planet's. Architect Stefano Burri is concerned with both. The air pollution was one of the cause of the, let's say, intensity of diffusion of the virus in some urban environment like Lombardia, Milano, New York, Madrid, Hubei region in China. So we have to seriously consider how we can clean the Arab cities. University of Birmingham research found that long-term exposure to air pollution increases deaths from coronavirus by 15%, making buildings like Stefano's Bosco Verticale or Vertical Forest in Milan a compelling blueprint for future cities. What we have done in the past is always to try to push nature outside us. And this uh, pandemics it's a, well, sudden, unpredictable demonstration that nature is inside us. His next major project, the riverside in Tirana, is an archipelago of urban villages built optimistically by the Albanian government as the first pandemic-proof district on the planet. The idea was to imagine a, a new district for basically 10,000 people. And we are, we are working on the idea to make this uh, district also capable to deal with uh, the post-COVID condition, uh, to give to every citizen the opportunity to find in 15 minutes all what he needs, walking. That's a very important concept for the future of our cities. At the end of the last century, a few men thought of building a new town once again planned to fit the people and to serve their needs. How big should the new town be? small enough so people could walk to work and within a few minutes of the open country. Building our way out of a pandemic has been tried before. Well, in Garden City, a century old this year, was conceived as a city of the future. It was established just after the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918, which killed 230,000 in Britain. By providing residents with everything they needed on their doorstep, from work to entertainment to access to nature, it was a deliberate attempt to reduce mobility and thus infection while creating a local urban paradise. There's something really nice about having different types of green space. So these are the landscaped green spaces internally. Um, but around the When the garden cities were first developed, it was based on sustainable principles, which are the same principles that we're talking about now. Most people have well-designed houses with good light, good ventilation, large gardens relative to the size of the houses. It's a fantastic place for families to live. There is now a growing movement to build new garden cities across the UK. 28 locally led developments are receiving government grants to assist their completion in the next decade. But architect Elsie Owusu thinks that starting from scratch is not the solution. It does need an awful lot of money and it needs an awful lot of time and we can see if there's another spike 
you know, if there's another pandemic, we don't necessarily have that time. So I think we have to be really creative about what we've got and about, um, about using architects and using engineers to make the difference now. Let's face it, location isn't what it used to be. Nowadays, it's cool to be healthy, even if that involves living further out. If we don't need to commute, then the suburbs suddenly become much more attractive. In places like Welling Garden City, estate agents report a doubling in average sales in the last five weeks. 50% of buyers are Londoners in search of an escape and space, now able to work from home. A lot of these were originally dwellings and were converted into offices um, and they're now being converted back to residential so you can, you can see that there's a change. High streets are contracting and moving more into the centre. What about our iconic high streets? They were in crisis long before Covid and the closure of multiple stores like the Debenhams here means the town centres need a new lifeline. One hope, converting abandoned shops into residential properties or just living above the shop the way that we used to. I think what's exciting for us is that it provides a much more vibrant community if you have people living above shops. It actually means that you have a 24-hour community and it just provides a better social balance. But what works in Welling Garden City might not translate into big cities. Tech giants like Twitter and Shopify are beginning to downsize their office space. What will happen to all these corporate citadels when their office floors lie increasingly empty? In the future, we will have to reinvent their residential appeal if we don't want a mass exodus to the suburbs, leaving behind urban ghost towns. We have learned to work at home. We have learned to use the digital tools in every moment of our life. We have to, to imagine a kind of exodus from super dense urban environment. And this is a very delicate issue because uh, uh, if city lost their intensity, the variety of cultures of people that inhabit them, which is what makes a city a city, it would be a disaster. Lockdown has felt like an eternity, but it has merely frozen us in a moment of transition. As we emerge blinking and disoriented into the future, it's up to us how we accelerate what we'd already started before COVID. This is our opportunity to reinvent how and where we want to live. It should be neither dull or ugly. Well, the potentially massive shift in where we will live and work will also have profound implications for the millions of jobs which have grown up around our city-centred economy. Our business and global trade correspondent, Paul McNamara, is here. Paul, what is the scale of the problem our cities are facing? Well, judging by the empty streets I've just driven through to get here, pretty significant. Truth is, though, we won't actually know for quite a while if what we're looking at right now is a wholesale transformation of how our cities operate. You know, companies are locked into leases for years. Landlords, unsurprisingly right now, aren't keen on letting companies out of those leases and a lot can happen in the meantime, such as if we get a vaccine. But there is real-time data that gives us a pretty good insight into how all of our behaviour and the public's appetite for cities has changed. So, shopping. People are returning to the shops, but they're pretty selective about where those shops are. So, look at this. Footfall in out-of-town retail parks is now down only 10% on the year. Not bad, given what we've been through. But on the nation's high streets, it's down a massive 39%. It's even worse than its cities. Here in London, footfall is down a staggering 61%. Similar story across all big cities across the whole of the UK. Cardiff, Belfast, Glasgow, Newcastle, all down almost 50%. What does this tell us? Well, it literally shows us people are voting with their feet. Given the option, they are choosing to be in less crowded places, places they can drive to in their own cars, places where they're not reliant on cramped public transport. It also reflects that we're not returning to our offices, so people aren't popping to the shops at lunchtime or after work. On the whole, all of that is bad for cities. It's not great for the economy either.
Thanks very much, Paul. Well, I'm joined now by Pooja Agrawal, an architect who founded Public Practice, a not-for-profit social enterprise focusing on improving planning, and George Clark, the broadcaster, architect and lecturer. Thanks both of you for joining us. We're hearing a lot about a big moment of change. Let's start with the upsides for many people, more working from home, more time at home, more cycling, cleaner air. But is there a way of making this sort of utopia a reality for huge amounts of the population. Pooja? I think um, the pandemic has really forced us to live in a very sort of unique and different way. And it's really revealed what the, what's important to live a really good quality life. So, you know, if we're talking about our homes, for example, it's sort of revealed how important space is. You know, do you have enough space to cook and have a meeting at the same time? Is there enough light for people to do their homework? Is there enough air to sort of breathe well? So um, it's also, so I think, really revealed how important your location of your home is. Do you have access to shops at walking distance? Do you have open space to exercise? And it's all of these things that, I think what, um, what's been revealed is that it's really has unequal society is all of these aspects are actually a massive privilege and this is what we really need to address. And George Clark, we saw in the film how Welling Garden City grew out of the last major pandemic. You know, a deliberate attempt to make a, a, a city where everything was in with, within reach, people could walk more. Are they the answers, Garden Cities? I mean, they are. We've been here before. A um, hundred years ago, Welling Garden City was a revolution. Um, I was brought up in a new town that was built in the 1960s. That in itself was a revolution. If you made those buildings and that environment even greener today and improved building standards and green standards and how we live, that template would still work as well in the 21st century as it did at the end of the 20th century. I think what's happened with the pandemic is and you've mentioned this in your, your features, that it, it's accelerated things a lot. You know, the high street was already struggling. It's struggling even more now. But I think some of the stats and figures that you put up in fairness are reacting to a period of time over lockdown, which has been very, very extreme. As lockdown's lifted, as a vaccine comes in, into place, which hopefully we'll get as soon as possible, people will start going back to work. Cities will survive. There's no doubt about that. But I think there's a much bigger conversation that needs to happen about mental health and well-being and where we live, happy homes, healthy homes, greener cities, greener villages. I've actually moved out to the countryside during the pandemic. I was in London. I've been there for 20 odd years. I wanted to be somewhere greener and cleaner because London isn't a green and clean city. And it's fantastic that we talk about new build opportunities and new build developments, but we've got 27 million existing homes in Britain that aren't green enough. So the government has to raise green standards and everywhere and legislate for that. Of, of course, arguably, one of the greatest dangers of this, we talk about potential for revolution, but it's that this revolutionary moment only really becomes a reality for people with money. How do you extend all the possibilities that we might have in terms of a better way of living to everyone, Pooja? I think this is where the role of architecture and planning is critical. Firstly, with architecture, I think often people think it's us deciding what colour your wall is. And actually, it's so much more beyond that, thinking about having space standards, that there's enough light coming into your home, um, that there's enough sort of connections to your play spaces. All of that is architecture. But also the role of planning is often seen as being restrictive, but actually it's completely the opposite. We need planning to ensure equality to make sure we've got enough affordable homes and good quality living happens on that kind of political level. So that is really the sort of role of architecture and planning really needs to be supported to ensure um, that equality continues. So I think when we talk about how do you achieve that sorry, equality? Sorry to jump in, sorry to jump in, but young people can't afford to get on the property ladder anyway. You know, the, the affordability crisis in housing is absolutely 
enormous and, and we do have a generation of people who are going to rent for many years and will never have the opportunity of owning their own home and this is all part of the debate and where politicians and government have to step in and say if we are going to have a zero carbon economy if we are going to be green if we are going to promote health and well-being in people's homes how are we going to do that as a country how is it going to be paid for and there was a little there was a comment in your feature actually where the lady said um you know, this needs to happen very quickly. It needs to happen fast. We don't have time to wait for these things. Well, actually, the things that we're building today should be lasting 150 years. We need to take a long-term approach, and no one's really doing that. I mean, we're supposed to be zero carbon by 2050. I, I'm, I'm an, an eternal I'm, optimist, and I don't think we're ever going to get there. I, I agree with George, thinking actually. about, you know, Sorry. So, sorry to cut across you. Finally, thinking about the cities themselves, this idea that, you know, it's a nice idea for some to flee the cities, but we need the cities to be vibrant, don't we? Absolutely. And I think it's trying to remember what it is about cities that makes place makes them really interesting places to live and it is the diversity of opportunities it's the diversity of people it's the diversity of users and it's really important that we sort of encourage that in terms of the mix of our communities but also supporting our the, the nighttime economy you know the music industry uh you know all of the our we talked about high streets being sort of the footfall being much lower, but maybe we can radically rethink that high streets are actually social spaces and it's not only Pooja about... Agrawal and George Clark. So sorry that we have to end it there, but thank you so much for talking to us tonight.